And thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I've learned uh, at case study in this room, I've learned that as a condensed matter physicist, I can talk about magnetism and get 12 people in a room. If you mention the word energy, it's like it's a different, it's a totally different discussion. <laughs> so I think I just always put those in my talks now from now on. Yeah, so uh, what I'd like to do uh, today is, um, given the broad audience, is I'm not going to delve very deeply into any one subject, but I'd like to cover a few subjects in energy and in particular, of course, emphasize the kind of work that we now do at Argonne National Labs. But I'll, I'll try to keep it at a fairly high level. Um, but I hope that uh, you guys will dig down when you find something that's really exciting for you. Um, so first, I will do what everybody does. I'm going to give you the challenge, right? What is out there? And why are we so worried now about energy? Uh, and then I will tell you a little bit, because I think you should know who I am and where I'm coming from now. I'll spend a few minutes talking about Argonne Labs. And in part, the reason we came here uh, my colleagues, Mark Peters in the back, my current deputy, the job I just left behind is in the back, and Steve Goldberg, who's, 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 um, who, who also I work very closely with, uh, have come here to try to stimulate um, uh, collaborations and interactions. And energy is one of those topics I think that everybody has a clear interest in. So I'd like to tell you a little about Argonne National Labs and then highlight uh, three or four technologies uh, that we're very interested in now. One is energy storage and the idea of pulling all the automobiles off the, the uh, essentially pulling them all, and making them all electric uh, and putting them on the grid. And so removing from gasoline. And actually look at that because it's interesting. Not only is it interesting from an uh, economic and a, an energy point of view, there's interesting, very interesting materials, physics and science and chemistry and, and batteries. So it's a very interesting topic. I'll talk a little bit about uh, also about um, modeling and simulation and how that can clearly impact uh, things like uh, transportation um, fine-tuning, for example, or enhancing uh, even combustion engines. Forgetting going to hybrid electrics, there's a lot of energy, a lot of energy savings, a lot of energy efficiency that one can gain just in designing, uh, designing um, better fuels, better engines, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then I'll also talk about fundamental material science and a new approach, which we call, many of us call materials by design. So uh, let me start off by laying the challenge. People have seen this many times. Uh, the basic idea is that, of course, our hunger, our thirst, if you will, for energy just keeps going up and up and up. And this is in quadrillion BTUs. If you want to convert it to something, many, many physicists and chemists might say uh, terawatts. But in, in 2010, we're consuming about 15 terawatts a year. And we're projected by the year 2050 to, uh, at, at very least, double that, and by 2100 to triple that consumption. That's assuming modest growth. That's not even crazy growth, including China and India. Uh, so even out to 2030, we're talking about doubling our consumption of energy. So the, just the question is, where are we going to do that? And of course, the constraint is the greenhouse gases. Nobody doubts that we're producing lots of greenhouse gases. This is an interesting chart that was produced fairly recently by the International Energy Agency. I find it very interesting. The red line here is essentially, the, this is in gigatons of, of CO2 produced every year. And the red line, you can see, just goes up and up. It's the, just to give you a sense, 2010 is way down here. So this is a projection way out into the future. It is a model, of course, but it says basically from now, if we go in business as usual, which is growth as usual, and I mentioned the energy growth, if we assume the energy growth and we assume this current mix of carbon producing energy sources like coal, petroleum, et cetera, then uh, out by 2030, that same time frame for doubling our energy consumption, we're way more than we're, 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 we're going out past 40 gigatons a year of CO2. Uh, what, what then the IEA did is they said, well, what can we do to, to mitigate that? and went through a bunch of steps and in some model found that just end use efficiency, just building efficiency, for example, automobile engine efficiency can get quite a bit of, of gains. Renewables, you know, solar is an obvious one, especially here in Israel. Uh, biofuels, which tend to burn more cleanly than, than standard petroleum does. Uh, and nuclear, of course, is a big part of it if you can start putting more nuclear on the on the, uh, uh, if you will, on the burner, and carbon capture and sequestration. I don't want to go into detail, but the point is that there is a model out there which says that, that you don't have to follow business as usual, that you can actually produce energy in a much more carbon efficient, uh, carbon efficient way. So this is just a very interesting but very motivating uh, view graph, I think, to say uh, where we're going. So what we need, uh, and this is getting back to my science roots, especially my Bell Labs roots, what we really need are some real innovations. And uh, because technology as it exists today, uh, can't just simply be extrapolated. That was the red line. Uh, it can't just be extrapolated. And real innovation needs to happen. And I'll try to convey some of that innovation to you today, where, the, where there's potential for savings 
uh, and where there's potential for innovative new technologies uh, that can really transform. This is just an example of some work we're doing, and I believe some of that work is also going on here at, at Technion, um, just solar fuels, and, and in fact going the way of, of plants, photosynthesis, doing uh, biomimetics, if you will. Uh, we don't know how to do this yet, not at a very efficient level, but how do you take CO2 and H2O and sunlight and catalyze that into something useful, sugars or alcohols. Uh, so you solve the problem immediately of taking sunlight and storing it. You don't have to worry about the storage problem effectively you store it in, in what is nominally an alcohol, which nominally, of course, is a lower carbon footprint type of a fuel to burn. So I'm not saying we know how to do this today. I'm saying this is where we'd like to go. Uh, it's a lot like inventing the transistor. So in my mind, you know, I, I th I'm, a, I'm a physicist. I think a lot about energy, though. And uh, a lot of scientists would ask, why should I care about energy? Well, I believe, and we had this discussion over lunch, I strongly believe that the science we need to do to, to jump these, to leap these, these huge hurdles will result in things like Nobel Prizes. This, this, is, this is a Nobel Prize. If someone can really extract, uh, you know, at 50 percent efficiency, extract, <laughs> extract alcohols from, a, from a, a benchtop catalytic experiment, we're close. So I just put this as a, some of you may know this, this is at Bell Labs. I don't know if you saw this when you were at Bell Labs, but this was in the museum at Bell Labs. This is the original transistor. It's just a, a nice reminder of how one thing can have such a revolutionary effect. Not to say that we're going to do that again, but we'll do something like it. So uh, opportunities for collaboration is really why we're here uh, today, but I thought I would just open it up. And this is really an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I've already mentioned this. Uh, there are many rich opportunities, uh, in particular in energy storage, not only current day uh, advanced batteries, lithium, and a lot of people are already starting to put lithium, a lot of auto companies, into batteries, uh, next generation battery, uh, electric hybrid electric vehicles. But what's beyond? Can you actually create a battery that has the energy density of, of petroleum? And the answer today is no, we're not even close. Orders of magnitude off. What would it take? That's a great question. And it's a lot of science, a lot of catalysis, a lot of material science, a lot of, a lot of interesting cool stuff. Combustion science. Um, Combustion is going to be around for at least 50 or 100 or maybe 1,000 years. We're still going to burn fuel. How do we make it better? How do we burn different fuels, cleaner, more efficient engines? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, material science, of course, in everything we do today, uh, we had this discussion at lunch too, and I'm, I'm a materials physicist, so I'm speaking from the heart here. Everything we have today, whether it's you know, your laptop, whether it's you know, your transmission lines, is all about material science that's gone on for the last 50 or 100 years. We're living off our past. We have to create the future. Material, it's all in my mind about material science, innovating new kinds of materials. And you'll see throughout my talk that that's sort of a, that's sort of a characteristic of what I believe, that that's very important. And one of the things that's fun to think about is could you really, des could you really design a ma material from first principles? Today, you know, if you think about simulation tools, even advanced simulation tools on, on petaflop computers, we still today can't predict accurately a band gap in a semiconductor. That's pretty embarrassing to say that, but it's true. We measure it. It's hard to predict it. Is there ever going to be a day when we can start predicting those things? Because we can. If we can, we can start thinking about taking that and shoving it back into a solar cell and making something really integrated and clever. And finally, if I have time, and I don't know if I'll have time or not. Uh, I apologize. I probably talk very quickly. I'm from New York, and that's just the way I am. Uh, but, but if I do, some interesting stuff that we do at the lab in decision science, which is an interesting kind of science which most materials and chemists and people, biologists, don't think a lot about. But decision science is a very important uh, and fairly advanced science using simulation, modeling and simulation tools to do things like model the grid and ask questions like, if I had a grid, a perfect grid, you know, where, what would I do? Would I put lots of big power plants? Would I put lots of little power plants? Would I distribute those? Uh, if I had solar and wind power, very variable energies, how would I maximize their input into the grid? Lots of questions like that. So, as I said, if I have time, I will, I will talk a bit about that. But before I get into any of this discussion, I hope I don't bore you too much, I want to talk a little about my home institution, just so you know who we are. Um, the very highest level, the Department of Energy runs uh, 17 labs. And of those 17, 10 of those labs are science labs. And they range in size from, let's say, $100 million materials labs like Ames Labs, all the way up to about a billion dollars like Argonne and Oak Ridge National Laboratories. Um, we are one of the multi, what they call multi-purpose science labs within the Department of Energy system. So the Department of Energy has been funding this suite of laboratories since the early days just after the Manhattan Project. In fact, they came out of the Manhattan Project, Los Alamos, um, Los, uh, Oak Ridge, they all were there at the start of the Manhattan Project to, to build the first bomb. Many of us actually, though, like Argonne, our history was actually in nuclear energy. We were formed by Enrico Fermi to explore nuclear for, uh, for, for civilian use, for energy uses. Today, we're about 700 million U.S. dollars with about 3,000 employees. 
And because we're unique in the sense that we have large facilities, we also have many users, which is an important connection to you, perhaps. You can see in the background, and I'll talk a little bit about more of this in a minute, we have a, a synchrotron. It's a big, many of you know what a synchrotron is. We take electrons and, and whiz around at 7 GeV and produce x-rays. That's actually what I do for a living. I use, I use the x-rays and look at materials. Uh, but this is the, the advanced photon source, and I'll talk more about our facilities in a minute. We have been operated from the very beginning. We were the first Department of Energy lab, and we were op we've been operated from the very beginning by the University of Chicago uh, ha as, a, as a contractor with the Department of Energy. This is sort of a, a strategy slide. This is, if I defined uh, what we do, this is what it is. We are a science laboratory, and in the bottom part of the slide, we really do discovery research. And the discovery research, of course, is all done with a mission, which is a little different than many universities in the U.S., of course. Universities are supposed to be sort of, you know, white, pa white paper kind of research. We do research. We do very fundamental research. We do high energy physics. We do re research in superconductivity. We do research in fundamental, you know, molecular structures, nanomaterials, all those within the context of a mission. And our mission is up on the top here, mostly energy. So we focus on energy. Clearly, there's a lot of fundamental science to be done in the name of energy, but also in the context of sustainability. We, do, we have programs, for example, in climate change, climate modeling. We have soil science programs trying to understand the interface between the air and the soil. How well does soil uptake nitric dioxide? How well does the soil uptake CO2? Those kinds of questions, which are certainly energy-related questions, but they're, they're environmental sustainability questions. And finally, um, national security has become very important in our country, certainly since 9-11. It's been important here since 1948. And so we think very seriously as a lab because we have the tools that can provide for national security. So we do things like since our lab has been a nuclear energy lab for many years, we know how to handle nuclear materials. We've been handling them since 1946. So we do a lot of work on nonproliferation. We do things, everything from import-export control in the Ukraine to actually building detectors to detect things like radioactive materials. So we do a lot of this kind of things, but all of them are based on our fundamental science. So we're a basic science lab in the interest of a mission, which is energy. I just want to highlight a couple things before I get to some of the science. Um, we one of the things that I would say is a lockout spec for Argonne National Labs, which makes us different from a universities, is that we provide facilities for the nation. And those facilities are, uh, include, I already mentioned, the advanced photon source. We're very proud of that facility. It's unique. There's two others like it in the world, one in Osaka in Japan called Spring 8 and one in Grenoble uh, called the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. Maybe some of you have been there to use it. Uh, this is ours. It's the same kind of machine, high energy, from our point of view, 7 Jeff machine. And of course, uh, I mentioned Arionath, of course, she's Weizmann, she's not a Technion. I don't know if she had the option to come here or not, but, but she, uh, she, of course, along with two of her colleagues, uh, finally solved the structure for the ribosome last year to a large extent using this ring, using the, the x-rays that come out of the ring to do the structure. And so one of the great things you can do here, as I said, is find the structure of these complex molecules that have you know, millions and millions of atoms in them. So that's the kind of thing you can do. We also have a, a growing program in computing. So we have one of the fastest open science computers in the world. It's an IBM Blue Gene P. Uh, it's at about a half a, a half a petaflop now. And we are on the way to 10 petaflops. You may say, who cares? It's a big computer. But a big computer, there's certain problems you can't solve any other way. And one of the, the cool problems, this is just an example, is an exploding star. This is a an exploding star, which is a complex thing, right? It's got many things like hydrodynamics, it's got fusion, it's got fission, all going on at the same time. Uh, so we can solve things like, uh, like supernovae in a, in a computer like this. Uh, whether we can validate it's a question, but we can certainly solve these problems. But we can also do things like uh, uh, grid modeling. We can do things like uh, modeling of materials. We can start thinking about materials by design. So that's the kind of thing we think about with our major facilities. Uh, I won't go through this list. We're going to leave behind the talk. But I just wanted to emphasize that when I said multidisciplinary, I really mean it. We have everything from condensed matter physics and large-scale facilities to applied materials. Uh, this is just an example of uh, oxide MBE system in which we grow complex materials. I'll come back to this in a little while. Uh, really a materials by design program uh, aimed at uh, um, making structures. This happens to be uh, a mod insulator inside of a semiconductor, but we won't go into details. But being able to grow really unique materials to, to essentially uh, for new properties. This might be useful, for example, in a, in a photo cell. <laughs> so uh, let me conclude my introduction to Argon by saying this is our origins. And I've mentioned this already. Uh, we started as an energy lab. We've grown. We're now a multidisciplinary lab. We do material science. We do fundamental physics. We do condensed matter physics. 
uh, but we don't, never forget our roots, and we continue to do nuclear energy, but also a whole range of other kinds of energy, which is what I'll talk to you about in the next 45 minutes or so. This is an interesting picture, because it really is. This is the original cadre of scientists. The, the first uh, sustained chain reaction, I'm sure you guys have heard this story before, it's called Chicago Pile 1. Uh, this is the, it was a graphite reactor, effectively. These are the graphite blocks. Uh, and, and in it, of course, was the, the hot material, uranium. Uh, and you can see in the background uh, their students standing over that block of, of, of graphite with buckets, literally buckets of water, in case, because no one knew exactly what was going to happen back then. And in case it ran away, you know, Fermi had his students stand over the, the uh, graphite blocks. <laughs> he's standing safely, well, I don't know if it's safely, but he's standing way over here. He's got his students here. There's now, if you go to the University of Chicago, right by the building where this, the physics is, the physics is today, there's still a plaque commemorating that event. Very important event, and obviously important for us, because that's what and ultimately led to our laboratory. This is a proud heritage. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do now is talk a little about science and technology, some of the stuff that we're excited about with regard to the science in behind the technology, if you will, that'll lead to energy uh, solutions. And as I said, I'm going to talk about storage, a little bit about storage, and a little bit about transportation. Combustion, which of course is part of transportation. Uh, a little bit about material science, and then if I have time, a little bit about uh, grid modeling. Uh, and, uh, and the effect, for example, of hybrid electric vehicles on a, on a grid, on a national grid. So let me st first start at the 10,000 foot level. Um, when we think about electrifying cars, you know, who cares? Uh, you know, today, a, a, a really good all-electric vehicle like the Tesla, I don't know if you guys have seen the Tesla. It's a car that's got 6,000 uh, laptop batteries in it, and it, it's a spectacular car. It runs out to about 100 or 150 miles on a single charge but it cost 120,000 US dollars, so it's not yet a viable tool. Um, so if you look at the, but you look at the, the, you look at the value proposition here. You know, why would you go electric? Why would you care if you went electric? It's really quite simple. It, it would cut, so if we took all of the US cars, currently we only have you know, thousands of cars that are electric, and we have, we have more than maybe hundreds of thousands of hybrids, but thousands of, of purely electric uh, vehicles. If you went all electric with cars and light trucks in the US, it would cut the oil consumption by a third, meaning that a large fraction of our consumption of petroleum in our states, as you know, it's very spread out, is in automobiles. Uh, if you did that, you would also cut that carbon footprint by 25%, because a lot of the carbon footprint is from the petroleum we're burning the automobiles. So it's a huge value if you could go to electrified vehicles. The problem is, actually on this next slide, uh, is that today we have nothing that comes close to gasoline in terms of energy density. So if you look, this, this chart is really specific energy versus uh, specific uh, short duration. P it's really power. Think about it as acceleration versus range. Americans love acceleration, but let's forget that for now. Let's look at where we are today. If you look at the, if you look at the batteries, the common like uh, nic uh, nickel zinc um, batteries or lithium metal ferrous life sulfide batteries here, um, which are the common batteries, Look how far away they are from gasoline. So gasoline, if you look at just about specific energy, which is how far a car can drive on a single charge, um, gasoline is out here. The numbers, you don't have to worry so much about the numbers until later on, but gasoline's out about 13,000 uh, watt hours per kilogram. So a kilogram of gasoline, so it's, I don't know what that is, a gallon or a couple of gallons, a few liters of gasoline, um, uh, gives you about a watt hour of power, okay? And so uh, that gives you maybe, you know, three or 400 miles on a tank of gasoline. Batteries today are at least a factor of 20 b behind that, if you just take a, a battery today. So the problem is that if I wanted a car to actually go two or 300 miles, I have to put a lot of batteries into the car. The car would weigh more. It wouldn't be very effective. So it's a non-trivial problem. I would say a factor of two is an engineering problem. A factor of 10 is real science. And there's real science in this. So this is what's interesting about the problem from a science point of view. And I'll show you a little bit more about that. So let me remind you about a battery, because you know, we all know how batteries work, but I'll remind you. Uh, basically, there are two electrodes. There's an anode and a cathode. The anode uh, contains some ions that can be transported through an electrolyte uh, toward, uh, the, the, toward another cathode, the electrode. And then, um, of course, electrons will flow the other way. This is a positive lithium comes this way. And then the electrons flow back this way. Do you charge the battery? When you charge it right, you separate out the charge. You bring the lithiums all the way to one side and push the electrons back. And then you connect it up and you let the electrons flow. And here's the switch or the motor or whatever you're driving. You, lo you let the electrons flow and the lithiums start relaxing out of the material. So there are many challenges in this. It's not as simple as you think it is. And I'm not going to go into detail. It's a fairly complex system. 
But one of the main challenges here uh, is, in addition to keeping it safe, because batteries can run away and get hot and burn, is the material challenge here, which is that I have to stuff a lot of lithium, lithium into, this, into this electrode here, into this anode. I have to be able to stick it in, remove it, and then put it back in again. And if you think about it, and if you, if you, if you think about <coughs> those of you that don't know the material science of this, if you take a unit cell and a material and you pull one of the atoms out of it, you change that unit cell dramatically. And you want to put it back in and out, in and out many times. You have to recycle it to make it a worthwhile battery. So it turns out if, what you want is a lot of lithium per unit cell, but that makes it challenging as a material problem because I can pull lithium out maybe once. Very often when you pull that much material out of a unit cell, that material falls apart. It's no longer a viable material. So we took an approach a few years ago. I should say that the original, so we now talk about lithium ion batteries. <laughs> lithium is great. It's light. You can stuff. It's small. You can stuff a bunch of it in. It's first uh, innovated by Sony Corporation in 91. Uh, but we now, um, we now work on lithium uh, quite extensively. And I just wanted to mention our approach. This is a material science uh, problem. Which, remember again, what I, st I said is that, is that the most important thing is you can, you can put a lot of lithium in and take it out without the material falling apart. One way to do that, instead of having a bulk material, is to have little pieces of material, very, very small nanostructured <laughs> materials. So then you can basically put material in, and, and nanostructures and materials tend to be much more resilient against putting, putting atoms in and out. So what we did is we took, uh, it's actually a ceramic, very fine, uh, fine grain ceramic, where we have two, actually two materials side by side. One material which is inactive and one material which is electrochemically active. And so in this case, right, we have this lithium Li2MnO3, which is inactive, and then an active lithium uh, transition metal. And it cobalt's one of the typical um, materials we use. Uh, and oxygen, where in this case, you can pull the lithiums in and out repetitively over and over again. And so the idea of having, having composite, and it's ceramic, remember, it's not single crystal. And these are uh, fairly small grains that are put together in a in a um, in a in a in a in a in a in an electrode. Uh, the idea is then you have the active material and the inactive material, which helps support it. And you don't have to believe me; you can look at some of the curves. I'll tell you quickly what this curve means. Uh, this is a, a battery that we've actually licensed to a company, Envia. Uh, Envia. Um, this is the discharge voltage. That's the amount of voltage you can over which the battery discharges, and then you have some capacity associated with that voltage, which is the amount of amps you can drive. So that's basically how good the, the, the quality of the battery is. And you, what you can't see here is there are lots of points here. Each one of those is a different cycle. So you keep cycling, you charge it, discharge it, charge it, discharge it, and as time goes on, of course, the battery loses its ability to charge anymore. That's partially because the material starts falling apart. It's partially because things start charging up, and you can't put the lithium back into the, to the, to the electrodes. But in the end, <clears throat> this smooth curve means that it's actually a well-functioning electrode. And the reason for me to show you this is that it worked. This was just a material that worked very well through some innovation, this idea of this composite, you know, active, inactive composite. Um, probably equally important for us is that as a laboratory, we got to license a lot of these. So I thought I would just mention it. I'll stick these in in a few places. You know, I, I'm trying to make the point here that, that you know, basic science or mater applied material science and basic material science actually can also be good uh, from the point of view of, of tech transfer. Uh, those materials that I mentioned have actually been licensed broadly, especially in these top companies. Uh, one of the ways, we're a government lab, and we can talk about this probably all day, a DOE lab, federal funding, the issue of licensing is an important one. Uh, we have something called buy dole laws, which make it difficult, but what you'll notice is we've licensed to many companies, not just one company, which is what the public money is used for. We, we create, we innovate, and we create IP, and then we can license to multiple companies. This particular innovation uh, got licensed to Enerdell, which you may not know. It's a company in Indiana which actually makes batteries. BASF, which I'm sure you know, is one of the lar it is the largest uh, I think chemical manufacturer in the world, and we license our materials as lithium-ion batteries to uh, materials to them. So this is actually a good way to have impact, not just publishing papers, but actually to get stuff out into the world. So that's current day systems. We're starting to think about what's, what's next. And um, what I'd like to do is just mention briefly where we're going now with the battery program. What I've shown you so far, and I should probably give you some numbers, um, is, and, and I, you don't have to remember this because I'm going to come back to this, but the specific energy, again, which is a measure of the to this total sort of uh, capacity, the, the distance you can run on a battery, uh, for this particular battery is about the best in the world. It's 250 watts watt hours per kilogram, okay? That's an important number to remember. A typical lithium battery is about a factor of two worse than that, about 100. So that's good in the start. But remember I told you, sorry throwing numbers out, I told you that petroleum or gasoline is about 13,000 watt hours per kilogram. So it's, it's, it's inordinately better, okay? So it's, it's much, much better than this number. 
almost, no, but not quite, two orders of magnitude better. So I'm going to come to that. So how do we get to that? And uh, one thing I, I wanted to mention is how the, how the DOE, the Department of Energy, funds the, some of the research we do. Uh, this, is, this comes out of the basic sciences research. And this is a brand new program that was launched last year by the Secretary of Energy, which has been a very good program. Um, uh, one that, that has been able to do things that we've never been able to do before. It's taken blocks of money, and specifically 46 of them around the U.S., targeted at specific problems, specific uh, barriers to making breakthroughs in energy technology. And one of the barriers I've already mentioned to you is getting enough charge stably into materials, understanding the interfaces between electrolytes and materials, but also understanding how to charge up a material, how to essentially dope up a material uh, reversibly with lots of things like lithium. This program, which was recently funded by DOE, is going to allow us to do it. It's about a $4 million program called an Energy Frontier Research Center. There are 46 of these around the nation. I'll mention another one in a few minutes in another subject. This one is really focused on the basic science side of, so what I showed you is an applied materials problem, but now we're going to start working on the basic science side. And the first thing is to think about how do I make those electrodes, that same material, that same <coughs> electrode, better. That, and I mentioned that that material was particulate. And remember, the reason it's good that it's particulate is that when I have the smaller the, the material is, the larger the surface to volume ratio is, the easier it is to stuff more material into it because it can deform and it, without falling apart and becoming unstable. So one of the things to do is go from micron scale particles to nanoscale particles. So this is really nanoscience in action. Uh, this is now in a battery actually. These are the same kinds of spinel structures, lithium transition metal oxide spinel structures, but instead of being micron, many micron scale, many micron scale, they're now at the sort of 10 nanometer scale which means that they have a bigger capacity. And if you look at the numbers here, see, did I write them here? I don't know if I actually wrote them here. We're up about three times the power density of the, of the previous example I showed you, simply because we can stuff more lithium into these things. And there's a second trick here, which is that these particles, these nanoparticles, not only accommodate more volume expansion because they're nanoparticles, we're also able to coat each particle in carbon which means that they're also more stable. Just in the electrolyte, sitting in electrolyte, those particles are protected. The carbon is transparent enough, if you will, diffusive enough to allow lithium to come in and out. Graphite's very good at that, right? It's very good at diffusing stuff. And at the same, so we can coat each of these little particles with carbon, and at the same time, allow them to expand and contract to accommodate a lot of that type of lithium in and out. So it's a technology that's, that's just burgeoning, but it's one that's really cool. So, but it's still lithium battery technology. And it's still energy stored in charge. Remember, I have two electrodes, and I've charged one against the other. It's still stored in, stored in electrical charge. The next step is to actually think about how we start competing with gasoline. Because the thing I showed you, even the nanoparticle lithium can't compete with gasoline. So how are we going to do that? Um, again, I'm going to back out again, a little high-level slide. I remember I told you you need a factor of 10. It's more like a factor of 20, 30, or 40. <clears throat> it turns out there is, a, a, uh, there is a type of a device out there, which is on paper today which might be able to get to the kinds of storage densities that, that compete with gasoline. And, and that's something called lithium air. There's other kinds of uh, uh, light metal uh, air batteries as well. And in fact, there's a program here in Israel. I'm not sure where it is. I think it's at Weizmann, which is, do you remember, Mark? It's, it's, um, it's not lithium. It's maybe potassium, but I don't remember. It's another one in the same column. But the idea here is really, uh, it's very exciting. And I'll tell you why it's exciting. From a materials scientist and a chemist, it's very exciting because, uh, mostly because it's impossible to do today, absolutely impossible to do. And the reason it's called lithium air, I can tell you quickly, because I do need to get on, but um, it, again, the two electrodes, you have a, a lithium rich material, you have some kind of electrolyte, and we envision some kind of solid electrolyte, a polymer blend actually, that allows lithium to diffuse, and then a porous membrane, a cathode, which allows air to come in. But instead of just having lithium transfer to this side, Right, get soaked up on this surface and then recharge it by pushing it back across, you do something else. You do chemistry. So you start taking advantage of chemical bond energy. You allow it to oxidize. So instead of just having lithium come over here and sit and then push it back, you bring it over here and you bring oxygen in through a membrane, which, which then oxidizes the lithium. And you effectively, it's like a fuel cell in a way, and effectively you oxidize the lithium. For example, you create lithium peroxide, Li2O2, that's a chemical bond. That's a, it's a volt of energy, right? That's much more energy than you get just by moving electrical charges around. So if you could do that and then, re and then recharge it, so then once you've created lithium oxide, you have to split the lithium oxide and get the lithium back to the other side. So what I've just told you, there's at least two or three impossible things in what I've just told you. One of them is to have a barrier 
that admits oxygen from one side and doesn't allow the lithium to leak out the other way. And that's not too bad, but you know, that's not easy to do yet. That's a very cool membrane that we haven't invented yet. We think it'll probably be some kind of graphite or nanotube membrane, but with chemistry on it that allows this diode effect with chemistry. The second is, and probably the most challenging one, which gets back to something I mentioned and I'll talk about again, is the problem, I can oxidize lithium very easily. It wants to, lithium wants to join oxygen and reduce its energy by doing that. The problem is cracking that lithium oxide again. That is a really hard problem. That's the same problem as cracking CO2, almost. So how do you do that? How do you get the catal catalyst to do that? So you need to invent the catalyst that will do that. And a lot of, if there's a chemist in the audience, they'll probably be saying, can't be done. But the hope is that we can start thinking about it using nano, basically nanocatalysis. So we actually, and I'll show you in a few minutes, we're starting to work on this problem too. So there's some really chunky problems in here for science, and you could sit here and say each one in themselves is a grand challenge, and it is. But if we can solve them, we have a battery, at least in concept. So the reason I think I'm excited by this is it's a cool thing, and if we can make it, we've solved a huge problem in electrifying vehicles. But along the way, it's that mission-driven science. Along the way, we have science in there, which is really important. And it's important not just for making batteries, but important for catalysis, important for, uh, for membrane science. You can make membranes. I mean, we're trying to do that all the time in, in life sciences as well, make membranes that are permeable one way for one thing and not, you know, not the other way. These are very important types of problems, hard but important. So I just want to show you, we're not, we're not just, you know, we're not just um, uh, you know, spinning into the wind with this. This is an example of a material we're exploring to uh, at least solve one of the problems, which may be the easiest of the problems, by the way, which is how do you chunk up a material with lots and lots of lithium? So there, is a there are many materials out there, actually. This one in particular, you can see this is a unit cell, lithium iron oxide. Each unit cell has five lithiums. The material I showed you before only had one lithium. It has five lithiums. So you can see there's lots of lithiums in there, and they're fairly weakly bound. So you have hope of pulling them out. And it turns out, if I delithiate almost entirely, if I take four lithiums out of this compound, I end up with something lithium iron O2. I have to get rid of oxygens too. But it turns out this compound is extremely stable, much more stable than this material. So if you can make this material, and we have, and go to this material, it's great because that's very stable. It's not going to fall apart on you. The challenge is, of course, going back again, but this show is going one way. This is applying a voltage, and, and it's the same kind of measurement I showed you before. And it turns out, look at the numbers here, but, but um, you can extract four lithiums from that, from that for per unit cell. I've already shown you can do it in a very, very ideal environment in an electrolyte. Uh, what that means, and at three and a half to four volts, which is important at these lower voltages, what it means is the capacity here, if I put capacity again versus voltage, the same I showed you before, we're already out to about, if, if once we put this in a battery, even in a battery, just a lithium battery, we're out to about 700 milliamp hours per gram, which is already about a factor of four better than I showed you before, simply before I can put, take more, more lithium out of it. So my point here is that there's, there's science that's to be done, really cool science, I think. This is material science. Um, at, to address some of these challenges in transportation. Okay, um, I'm going to change gears a little bit here and talk a little bit more about transportation, but a little about combustion science. And um, so that was a story about material science. Now we'll talk a little bit about uh, modeling and simulation and some experiment. Uh, and this is another sort of value proposition here. Um, combustion engines, even if I, you know, if I think I'm going to electrify all the vehicles, I'm lucky if I get 30% of them electrified by 2050. So I still have a lot of combustion engines to deal with. And the questions being asked now is, is there a lot of efficiency to be gained in fine-tuning combustion engines? And we believe the answer is yes. Uh, at least 25 to 50% improvement. So if you could get a 25% improvement, that's a lot of, a lot of car, greenhouse gas and a lot of fuel saved. This is a chart that was recently published, which uh, plots, I'm sorry about this. Uh, this is uh, gigatons of CO2 per year. This is the greenhouse gas. Again, a projection. So here we are in 2010 now. This is a, project, a projection uh, and then mitigation for not doing business as usual. So you can see business as usual again goes from 2010 out to 2050 or you know, roughly not doubling but about 50 to 70 percent more greenhouse gas emission. Um, there are now in the U.S. something called CAFE standards which are standards to make cars just more fuel efficient. So just get more miles per gallon. That will reduce uh, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions just because you're burning less fuel. Uh, advanced engine design, you know, again, this is the same kind of chart I showed you at the very beginning of the talk. This is specifically focused on, on, on just a few things, uh, not the power grid, but just automobiles and transportation. 
Uh, but you can see there are various things you can do to get down, a lot of struggling, but to get down to something that's 20% of the 2005 greenhouse gas emissions. And they're not all crazy. 30%, if you just electrify 30% of the vehicles and do all these other things, then you've got yourself a real change. This is a factor of four or five change over where we are today, which is really remarkable, just by doing all of these things. But just the engine tune-up itself is worth 25 to 50%. So I just wanted to mention what we're doing at Argonne in that. And I apologize, this is a complex slide, but I'm just trying to show you everything we're doing in one slide. Um, this is really the whole, the whole fuels and engines for low carbon footprint transportation program at the lab. I will be honest, they're not all coherent like I'm showing you in this slide. They're all programs at the laboratory. I'm presenting them to you in a coherent way. They involve everything from basic science in chemical processes, things like cata catalyzing um, um, uh, uh, you know, grass, for example. So switch grass, it's very hard, it's, it's a cellulosic material. How do you break it down and make it useful in fuel? So we do programs like that in bioprocesses as well as in chemical processes. And then we also take these uh, fuels. We can take the fuels that we generate out here in these, if you will, chemistry and applied chemical engineering programs and stick them into real, uh, real engines and real uh, computations. So again, this is just meant to show you what we're doing. We have a program in first principles combustion chemistry, which is one of the most challenging things in combustion there is because each uh, combustion, for example, involves thousands of different species of chemicals uh, and temperatures and, and ignition, et cetera, all mixed together. So calculating the thermodynamic pathways for all those uh, elements under, under burn conditions is a very complex computational problem. We can't pretend to be getting close, but we have actually made some inroads. We have modeling and fundamental testing. I'll show you, uh, I don't know, I think I'll show you. We, I mentioned the APS, the Advanced Photon Source. Um, not only can we do the computation, but we can actually go in and look inside of engines using x-rays. So we can look at things like how the combustion actually happens in situ. Um, and then one of the things we're very proud of is this thing called GREET, and I'll talk about that briefly, which is entirely a simulation tool. But what it allows us to do is say, if you can come up with, if you, if you can produce, uh, let's call it ethanol, a biofuel ethanol out of switchgrass or even corn, which is easier to do, uh, we can calculate the, the exact or exact, the approximate um, cost of that energy from the farm all the way to when it's burned, both the cost of the fuel, fuel efficiency, but also the amount of carbon footprint that that fuel produces. It's a fairly sophisticated model that's now used fairly broadly. So I'll just mention these in passing. Uh, this again is a complex slide. I apologize. A, a colleague of mine made it for me. But um, the reason I show it is because, and I won't go into detail, is that the major challenge really is a model for combustion. It's not easy to do. And the modeling is, is actually very complex, as I've mentioned, because it involves thousands of chemicals, all combusting, exploding at once through a nozzle. Um, but one of the things we've managed to do, and this is actually a collaboration with Professor Burat here. I don't know if you, does anyone know him? He's a chemist or chemical engineer. I think he's retired, but he was here until about a year ago at, at, at Technion. And he collaborated with one of our, our scientists to try to actually calculate the thermodynamic pathways, the thermochemical pathways. Uh, in a simplified version in, a, in, a, uh, in an engine and was able to successfully uh, redo that calculation. So now we're getting better at being able to predict. Uh, and I, again, I won't go through all the details on this slide. Um, <clears throat> I do want to highlight, I've been hi trying to highlight a little bit where we can have an impact on industry at our lab. We do a lot of basic research. Um, I did mention that um, we, we were able to look inside of engines. So this is actually a, what we call as a transparent engine. Uh, we don't, of course, shine x-rays through when there's a guy looking through it, but this is a transparent engine. There's a nozzle here, so you can actually uh, use, you, you have a, it, real combustion occurs inside this engine, and you can image it uh, with, with very high, very fine detail down to the even nanometer level. Uh, so you can study fuel sprays, not just to study the sprays, but also to validate models. So a company, we work with a company called Bosch, which is a well-known diesel company. They, they make, they make uh, diesel uh, fuel sprays, et cetera. And they're very interested, of course, in, uh, in, in the details of what a fuel spray looks like, not on a case-by-case -case basis, but they're interested in modeling it, getting a good model so that they can do this back at their plant. They don't really care about coming to our laboratory. So we work in a partnership with these guys, in this case, to, to make uh, nozzles more efficient. And so by, by being able to measure the fuel sprays, you can fine-tune your model, essentially validate the models. Um, I'll mention briefly this, this program, which, which is a a big deal in the sense that it's a fairly sophisticated model. It's called GREET, which is Greenhouse Gases, Regulated Emissions, and Energy Use in Transportation. Um, it's basically, as I said, farm to fuels or wheel, wells to wheels. So it's a way of 
of evaluating the consumption of total energy as well as the emission of greenhouse gases, which is a very important model to have because, because in great detail, the fuel you choose, the type of engine you choose, uh, the type of vehicle you choose to burn it in will have a big impact on the amount of efficiency and the use in that engine. So that's just a tool. Um, so let me, I'm going to conclude now on this discussion on combustion just to mention the future again. This is another one of those um, uh, energy frontier research centers. And I've been keep, I keep talking about catalysis. Uh, the fundamental problem of catalysis, converting, for example, CO2 and H2O and, and energy, call it sunlight, into something useful like, uh, like, like sugars, like uh, things that you can actually burn in an engine or things you can use as fuel. Uh, it's a really s a, a complex problem. This is supposed to be a, a, a graph that, per that, that shows how it works. You, know, you, need, you need hydrogen, which would come from, of course, breaking water, which is a challenge in itself. You can do that with sunlight. You've got CO2, which has to be cracked to CO. There's a lot of stuff going on here. But uh, this is, again, future work. But this was just funded last year in one of these EFRCs. So it's, again, Department of Energy looking at the basic sciences that need to be the basic sciences that need to be cracked in order to solve some of the big problems. And it, I always find the, the number very interesting. So uh, I think across the face of the earth, we, we create, in, in industry, we create about a half a billion tons of, catalytically produce about a half a billion tons of chemicals each year. A half a billion tons, so, a yeah, half a billion. Uh, we produce in CO2, I showed you before, about 20 billion tons. Um, so, uh, you know, when you talk about, about um, the idea of trying to catalyze the CO2 as a way to consume the CO2, it's nearly impossible. But when you talk about it on a local level and talk about thinking about using CO2 as a fuel source, it's a very compelling thing to be thinking about. It's basic science, but it's basic science that needs to get done that hasn't been done very well yet. Okay, uh, when do I need to finish? About 5.15? Well, you now. Okay, so that's 5.15? Yeah. Okay, so I've been sort of nibbling around the, the edges a little bit on material science, but let me come right to material science now for a few minutes and talk about materials at the heart of of energy. Uh, again, you know, so I, I hate to do this. I will do it. I go back to my days at Bell Laboratories. Uh, Bell Laboratories was a, uh, a research lab in, an, in, in a basically a communications company, information technology. And, uh, and in that mission-driven research, many Nobel Prizes were won, great science was done, and great technology was innovated, like transistor, like the laser, all those things. I don't want to keep saying the transistor because we need more innovation. But um, energy provides, in many ways, the same kind of motivator, the same kind of mission. Um, the challenge, of course, is that industry isn't the same out there as it was for IT back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. We didn't have the same Intels. We didn't have the same AT&Ts. We don't have that out there. But nonetheless, a lot of the problems that were driven by that mission, which was information technology, are getting driven in a slightly different way, but equally promising way under the, the, the mission of energy. So, I mean, I keep preaching this, but having a mission is actually a good thing. And so this just gives a list of all the things you think about in energy. You think of generation. If you think about generating a power through using photovoltaics from the sun, um, you know, today it's about a factor of two to five too expensive. However you want to calculate it, you can go ahead and calculate it. Um, not only is it two to five too expensive, it's also very hard to scale so far. I have no doubt that we'll be able to do that. But it's a materials problem. Conversion. Uh, taking electricity, again, a solar problem, but how do you take sunlight and convert it into electron hole pairs? Uh, that's a materials problem. Distribution, most, mostly we use copper today. Can we use things like superconducting materials? There's now a beta test outside of New York City on Long Island where they have about a kilometer of superconducting, high temperature superconducting wire, which they're using as a beta test to carry power, uh, and it's, so far it's working. Can we do that in all major cities? Can we do that maybe in Haifa? Can we do it in places like uh, New York City? Um, storage, I've mentioned this challenge, a lot of materials there, and then even utilizing. So there's a lot of materials challenges, and the question is how do we accelerate materials design? So one of the issues we've had historically, the way we've approached materials is very Edisonian. And I know because I'm a material scientist, chemists maybe are a little more innovative with this. We innovate a material, lots of people look at the material, figure out what the material does, right, and then go on to the next material. But <clears throat> there's clearly a, a closed loop that we haven't quite closed yet anywhere really very effectively, which is not only just to create and, and discover and understand and control, but also to predict and design. So imagine being able to, uh, I've been talking about computing, imagine being able to design a material from first principles, the semiconductor gap, for example, or something more complex like a, a multi-component material that not only has a gap that absorbs sunlight, but also has the right levels to molecular levels, for example, that separate the charge, the electron hole charge, to capture them for use in energy applications. 
So um, we're starting down a path at Argonne, but this is really an international problem because especially this vertex here is a real challenge because even today we're just starting to be able to predict materials. And I'll go show two examples where we've been able to do that. Uh, this is an example of actually a calculation of a new material where you can stuff a lot of lithium. So, you know, it's a, it's a stable, calculated to be stable, and we're going to grow it. Um, but you can predict stuff and then grow them. This is a, actually a, a multi -froic. I'll show you on the next slide, where we didn't know this material existed. We knew roughly it was an, it's an oxide material. It took a, a theorist to sit down with a computer. He did some uh, critical thinking, and then he did some critical computing, and he ended up predicting a material which isn't grown in equilibrium, and I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, but then turned out to be a, a wonderful multi material. So it's a nice little story. Same thing with catalysis. So we want to close this loop and make it a much more facile loop where you accelerate the discovery. And that's become a very important mantra for us at, at Argonne, <coughs> I think, around the world. So this is just an example. Um, I don't know if everyone knows what a multi is. It's, it's a very simple concept, not, hard to, not, not easy to make. But a multi doesn't necessarily have to do with energy, but it's, it's an interesting complex oxide material. In particular, this one is iron, titanium, oxide, okay? And what's interesting about multi is that both magnetism and ferroelectricity exist in one material, which means that if I apply a magnetic field, I can change the, the, the ferroelectricity. Perhaps more interesting, I can apply an electric field and change the magnetism. So these materials are rare. They're hard to make. And so and the interest, of course, is mostly in the IT business where you can you want to couple directly from the electric circuits into memory, not have to go magnetic in some funny way. So you can imagine that if you apply an electric field to this kind of material, you can store a magnetic bit of information, <coughs> which is pretty important. Um, this is just an example of, of a theorist who was working at Oregon, who's now at Cornell, uh, Greg Fenney, who sat down. He spent about a year doing this, sat down, and he tried to find. He knew, he knew the space he wanted to work in, which was in complex oxides, but he found a material that had iron, of course, which is magnetic, but also had a distorted unit cell, which would give him a net polarization in the, in the unit cell. And it turned out he predicted it. He predicted the structure. But if you just try to grow it um, in a melt, for example, which is the way often crystals are grown, or you try to grow it, you know, sort of you pull it out of a melt, uh, you can't grow it. It turns out it, this, this structure just doesn't grow. Uh, so what had to happen was uh, he was the guy who predicted you're going to have to do this at, at 18 gigapascals. That's a very high pressure for growing materials and 1200C. I don't think he got the numbers exactly right. But he said, you're not going to get this as an equilibrium phase. The only way you're going to get it is if you apply pressure to grow it and then release the pressure. And lo and behold, this is not a huge crystal, but it's, uh, it's roughly on the order of a millimeter. So it's actually pretty big for a first, a first pass. So what I claim is this is a great example of this materials by design, where you get a theorist who can design the material, predicts it, Right? We actually grow it, and then we go ahead and characterize it, show that it does what it has to do. This is a loop which I think is very important. Here's just a, oh, I should say, here's our ultimate goal. I don't know many of you, any, are there any semiconductor scientists in the audience? No? You are? OK. So you know, you know this famous book by Zian Eng. Um, this is the classic book. If you, if you want to know about semiconductor devices, you go to this book. Uh, and, and the reason you can actually even write a book like this is because we have tremendous control over semiconductors. We can grow them really beautifully. So our goal is to do the same thing for complex oxides. This is just sort of semi-tongue in cheek. But one day, we think complex oxides will have the same ability to fine tune with a much more rich space because, of course, oxides are also good in chemistry. They're also good for catalysis. They're not just good for electronic applications like semiconductors. Here's another example. This is a nanoparticle example of uh, materials by design. Um, <clears throat> it turns out that, uh, again, I won't go into a lot of detail. I'll give you the result, and then I'll tell you what happened. But the idea is that this is a platinum catalyst, right? Uh, catalyzing si fairly simple reactions of, of basically carbon and c actually CO2. This is that CO2 catalyst we're looking for. Um, and if you just take straight platinum, uh, platinum surface, just a wide open surface like that, you get almost no reactivity. If you take a one-on-one -on -one surface, it goes up a little bit. But it turns out if you take these nanoparticles, which comp are composed of mostly platinum but with some, uh, some amount of nickel embedded underneath the surface, that the reactivity goes way up. And it turns out the reason is that the nickel starts pulling on the platinum D-bands and is able to control the bond structure at the surface, but only in a nanoparticle, and only in a nanoparticle because the nanoparticle, platinum nickel is not a stable material. It just, it's not a stable 
material. But if you go to the nanoparticle, nanoparticle structure, it becomes stable. You can put lots of you can put some nickel and platinum. It turns out when you put nickel and platinum, this is all predicted. So what I'm telling you is all predicted. It segregates, and it turns out it doesn't like to be on the surface layer. It likes to be the nickel likes to be just subsurface like this, not necessarily ordered, but subsurface randomly. And that's enough of an effect on the surface layer that does the catalytic activity that it actually pulls the D-bands and causes catalysis to be much, much more effective. It essentially lowers the D-band to make it energetically more easy for the charge transfer to occur. Uh, and this was all predicted. So it was computation literally on a computer designed and, and, and even segregated on a computer. And then we went off, uh, 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 this guy, Ninad Markovich. So the guy who actually predicted this was uh, Jens Norskov, who's over in Denmark. The guy who grew it was uh, Ninad Markovich at, at Argon, and he measured it and basically got a result. So this is pretty cool. This is actually, I think, materials by design. Um, this is just to say this is how we're doing it at Argon. Uh, we have, I've already mentioned our computing. I've already mentioned our characterization tools. This is just the APS. We also have a, a very large electron microscopy center, which we're very proud of, some of which is in the Center for Nanoscale Materials here, and some of which is in another building. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip through this because I don't think I have the time, as interesting as this is. Maybe I'll just show you one piece, um, which is this. Um, this is really a story about information sciences and, again, simulations. Going back to my second topic, simulations and how important simulations can be for understanding where we're going to go on a grid. Um, and this happens to be a simulation of a part of the United States and what would happen uh, when we have about 30 percent penetration of, of, hybrid ele of, of electric vehicles. So you can imagine if you have 30 percent penetration, which is many, many orders of magnitude more than we have today in the States, <clears throat> and something I know that Israel, I forget the date, but there's some date by which Israel is going to be all electric. Is that, is that right? <laughs> Come on, don't laugh. Anyway, if you're going to do that, you have to worry about you know, what that means because people go home. You know, they get home at 6 o'clock or 7 or 8 o'clock after they work, and they plug their vehicle in. And these are fairly substantial, hungry vehicles. So you're, you're drawing a lot of current, right? So the question is, what does that mean for the grid? It turns out it means a lot. So this is just, it, this is a taking what's called Western Interconnect. It turns out there are, this is actually, I found this funny, Mark. There are three regions that are just deter, that are de defined in the US. One is the East Coast, one is the West Coast, and one is Texas. I don't know. <laughs> and I don't know why. Texas is a big state, but not that big. Anyway, this, was, this is a region of this Western, called Western Interconnect. They took that whole region. This is just a model done at Argon, right? They took the region. You can see here the total load. This is really the total load that's in the sort of 100 megawatt region, right? So this is just everything, refrigerators, industry, everything. And said, so what would happen if we went to 30 percent, given the populations, what would 30 percent penetration of vehicles? And so you go from blue is just base load, right? So you can see you're not surprised. This is, by the way, hours. That's the day, two days, three days, four days, and that's power. And you can see, you know, you can see, and, and this, by the way, here is just the, the plug-in hybrid vehicle load, the green stuff. And here's the superposition of the two. And what you can see is that um, there's this spikiness, right? So when people get home, they plug in their vehicle, and sure enough, the, 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 the demand goes way up, higher than anything else. And of course, that means is the price goes up, right? So what we want to do as consumers is we want to buy low. We want to buy when it's as, as low as possible. So this is very far away from material science, mind you. But, but if you do the modeling right, it turns out that if you have smart cars, so it turns out you can actually use it to your advantage because there is a natural ry rhythm, circadian rhythm, if you will, in the base load anyway between day and night. So the proposal is not only to, to, to say that it's going to hurt, but it can actually help flatten the load, especially if you have a, a lot of nuclear plants. They really care about having flat loads. Nuclear plants don't like to cycle up and down. They like to be flat. So it turns out you can actually do much better cost-wise and, and also delivery-wise if you have your vehicles being smart vehicles and you space them out over the night. Maybe this is an obvious answer, but you wouldn't have actually known that before you did this kind of modeling. So I thought that was pretty cool. I thought I'd show that. Um, we're in Israel, so I th I'd sort of say we, we have many collaborations already. This is another thing that we do in information sciences, and I'll just mention it. Probably nobody here cares about this, but it is an important interaction we've had over the years. Um, and in particular, this idea of of modeling the electric sector, not just from an energy consumption point of view, but also from an economic investment point of view. And the big questions like, if you're investing in new power plants, what do you want, right? Do you want a lot of little ones dis dis dispersed, or do you want a few big gigawatt type reactors? I mean, if you were to build, if Israel was to build nuclear reactors, and you know, would you want one big gigawatt reactor sitting near Haifa and near Tel Aviv, or do you want a lot of 100 megawatt reactors 
that are spread out. And these are the kinds of things that we're, we can model, but also that we're now involved in, te in, in educating and teaching. So there is this thing called the grid school, which is going on, which just went, actually, and we were very engaged with an Israeli group on that. OK, so I think I've said everything I can say. This, by the way, is a beautiful picture. It's, it's, a, it's a simulation of a catalysis. This is also a catalysis by design. This is propane to propene. It's one of the biggest industrial catalytic activities. I don't want to talk in detail about it, but it, it's these, go these are gold particles. It turns out, and many of you know, gold is inert. You can eat it. But if it becomes nanoparticles, it becomes very active. So we did some calculations. These are gold clusters, 10, 20 atoms. And it turns out they're very catalytically active. So just to repeat what I said, I think there are a lot of areas for us to collaborate. Uh, I've said a lot, and probably too much, actually. But I've said a lot. I'm sorry I had to, s to skip the decision sciences. But you know, overall, there's just a huge amount of interesting science and technology to be done under this overall all mission of energy. And I really think that it's, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of so much of the future can be focused on this. Um, and I think I'll finish there and take any questions that I, you might have. <laughs>